Well, the history of the School for the Blind starts in Gary, South Dakota. And I'm glad to say that Gary is my home. Oh, I love the hill part of it. Oh, isn't this wonderful? All these rolling hills, it's not flat. It's just a beautiful rolling hill. I believe that school in Gary gave me a lot. It gave me an independence and I, it helped me in, uh, you know, in organizing, organizing my work, uh, organizing my life. Uh, and besides the teachers gave me of their talents, of the music, uh, the love of music, all kinds. And we had teachers who read books to us. There was one teacher who would read us the timely books that were out. And so we, we got a taste of everything. It's got to be nerve-wracking for parents to bring their students, their children, up to a school like this, and whether it's in Aberdeen or in Gary, and then leave and be assured that their children are going to be well cared for and nothing's going to happen to them. And I think Mrs. Goldie was one of many, many house parents that we've had and staff in general that looked after these students as though they were their own. It's another one of those things from the history that that takes me back to all the stories that my grandparents told me about the thrashing and uh, not having electricity and having to haul water and uh, walking to school and it, it just reminds us and makes me appreciate um, what so many people have gone through for us to get to the comforts of the world that we have today. And well, I should say the late years of the territory, just prior to statehood. Uh, students from South Dakota who are blind or visually impaired really couldn't be educated in the state. And so the state agreed to make a contract to send students there, and the contract was actually made with Iowa, which was then called the Iowa College for the Blind. But Gary, South Dakota got into the picture um, after they lost the county seat battle to Clear Lake. And so that left an empty building uh, in Gary, and a man by the name of Don Robinson, who was an attorney, he was a politician, he was the editor of several newspapers, he was a real mover and shaker in early Gary. And he also had a visual impairment himself. And I don't know if that's why, but he got interested in the idea or the possibility of donating some land to the, to the uh, territory of South Dakota for a school for the blind. And locally people thought he was maybe a little bit out there initially, but he talked people into it. They mounted a campaign, they took it to the territorial legislature, and they were successful. On December 11th, they're having a town meeting in, in this auditorium. We're gonna have it ready to basically, I think, share people's stories. And uh, I almost forgot the year when I came, but I must have been about six years old. And a neighbor brought me to Gary, and I'd never been very far away from home. And of course, the language we spoke was German, so I had to learn English. I'm sure the kids couldn't figure me out. I don't know. I started as a sixth grader. I remember going to the school and uh, going up into a room and unpacking. And uh, it was in a room with about three other girls. And we had a matron in the building and she was to watch over us. Well, everything was in order, and uh, it was a very good, good school. I, you know, as kids, you know, sometimes you don't like rules and regulations, but it uh, was a wonderful, wonderful place. When I was in service, my dad got a hold of an 1863 Civil War musket, muzzle loader. And so when I started at the school at Gary, I took that down one, one week and uh, in the fall of 1960, gathered a bunch of boys together and we went, I suppose, out to the gulch and fired that thing. We'd go down there w with this big musket and all of us boys looked forward to that because, you know, like most boys, they want to uh, you know, shoot firearms or something like that. And what we'd do is they'd tie a balloon and we'd put a balloon across the 
uh, across the creek and we tie it to a limb and what, what uh, those that couldn't see it they would try to help them to aim but the whole idea was just to give us uh, uh, the feeling of being normal if you will to be able to just hold a musket and shoot it and to show us how to load it and and that was quite interesting um. That's when I found out that there are several people that you want to make friends with first. The house parents, the uh, maintenance staff, and the kitchen staff. The superintendent can come later, but those three you should really make friends with first. <clears throat> I didn't get the boys back at 5 o'clock when dinner hour was, and I got in a wee bit of trouble with the, woman, with the, ladies, uh, or with the boys' house mother. Uh... She's an interesting lady. It's an exciting project because of so many people in the community um, have the same vision and have wanted to see this. It's become a real focal point for, uh, for everyone in the community to get on board and have helped us create ideas with uh, what to do with the facility. And uh, we had a, a meeting here uh, in December that uh, over 140 people in the community showed up in a frosty night and uh, about 20 below zero and uh, we had a, had a lot of fun just uh, hearing all the, the great ideas and the stories and, and people that uh, were involved or went to school here. And the old barn um, has quite a bit of history to it. Obviously it was built as a barn and a guy by the name of John McLean was a herdsman who took care of the cattle and they milked 24 cows here. Um, but the barn had a lot of other uses. It as we're told, it, it held the very first sanctioned high school wrestling match ever held in South Dakota. And it was the Blind Students and the Watertown Arrows. And then also Camby Wrestling, who was famous for wrestling, got its start at the Gary Blind School in that barn. There was one mat. We had a gentleman here just yesterday telling us that there was just one mat up there. And when you wrestled the students, uh, you had to tie up, tie up with them first. You couldn't take them down until you tied up. But the minute, he said, the minute I touched that, that student, he said, I was on my back. So they were very quick and they were very astute once they got a hold of you. Um, also the barn was a basketball court and uh, the Hook brothers were Golden Glove boxers and they gave boxing lessons in that barn for a number of years and there are still people today that had training, boxing training in that barn. This will be the main entrance to the hotel. You'll see uh, you're standing, that, that's going to be the lobby, so when you come in there will be a breezeway. There has to be a, an additional staircase put in to access the, the upper level. So when people come in, this again will be the lobby. The wall that behind you will, will be removed, so this will be one, one open great room. My mother and father uh, met at the state school. My father worked for the Board of Regions and was a coordinator and chauffeur for Mr. Ringsrud, who was, I suppose, the president of the board. And he was uh, assistant to Joe Woodbury, the engineer. And they were, the school at that time, it was like a family. They were all friends all through life. Anything big was held at the auditorium. Memorial Day, that was a big day. And uh, then the Farmer's Night, that was a huge night. Oh, they had a program and they gave out prizes. The, the, the town entertained the, the farmers. And then the children from the, from the state school, they came down and joined in. But it seemed like there was something real off in hell there. I remember coming here uh, when I was uh, about 12, 14 years old, my folks would bring me down to the concert here. At, uh, the blind kids would put on a concert, and were they ever good? Could they ever sing? It was really interesting. Uh, it was a real nice thing. Uh. We had uh, a lot of music. We had plays, we had operettas, and of course concerts, band concert as well as recitals. I enjoyed the operettas because I liked acting. I roomed in a boys' dormitory. Uh, my wife was in Aberdeen, and so I would come home on weekends. Uh, being in a dormitory and 
of course, the buildings, there were three, three main buildings on there, boys' dorm, girls' dorm, and administration classroom building. They were all connected by underground tunnels, really, and I can remember getting up at 7 o'clock, 6 o'clock in the mornings, and by 7 o'clock I could hear the chorus practicing over in the girls' dormitory, and the sound would carry through the tunnels. And I always thought that this, the School for the Blind chorus had a unique sound. Uh, there are choruses and then there are choruses, and I think the School for the Blind was one of the second. Somehow they achieved a, a, a sound that I that you don't hear very often, a very pleasant sound. We had activities such as roller skating in the uh, auditorium there, as well as outdoor roller skating and, and free time for all of his children. And they really were very, very fluid roller skaters. In 1955, there were some concerns surfacing on the part of the then superintendent who was trying to convince the board that there needed to be some work done in that building. Um, some of the issues that uh, we talked about were um, lighting conditions in the classrooms. There was sort of a changing educational philosophy and the term that was being used at that point was sight saving. And so if you had some vision, you were taught in what were called sight-saving rooms. And so that meant controlling lighting and other kinds of, of things, which really wasn't something that was possible in rooms that generally were lit with one single fixture in the middle of the room. So that was one of the issues. Another one was temperature control and ventilation. The other was that there weren't sufficient bathrooms in the main building. The kids had to go back over to the dorms to use the restroom. So it really wasn't terribly convenient and they were issues that uh, the superintendent was trying to get the board to address. At that point they felt that there were some question of whether or not money should be put into the campus at Geary. The things needed to be done with that building. Should they be repaired? Should that building uh, be replaced? And if so, should it be replaced on the Geary campus? or should it be moved somewhere else? And that was really the beginning of that discussion. I think the community of Gary uh, definitely had some advantages. Uh, it's a small community, it's beautifully situated. The students, I think, enjoyed the community. I'm sure the community enjoyed the students. Walter Hack was the superintendent at that point and he was really trying hard to convince the board and the legislature that what that they ought to be doing is renovating or building a new building on that campus. And he really thought that that was what, what they ought to do and where they ought to stay. At that time, I suppose, yeah, I was chairman of the local farmers union and we pushed to keep it here. If I remember right, we went out to peer to the legislature and talked to them, tried to get them to see our way. But it, was, it just didn't do any good. <laughs> Because, you know, the governor said it was a fire trap. Most people around the state believed it. So we didn't have enough votes on this end to keep it. The commission recommended that, that it be moved to a different site, primarily because of uh, where it was located in the state, uh, the fact that there wasn't good public transportation or accessibility, um, they cited things like lack of a doctor and dentist, those sorts of things in the community. And so the decision was made to start looking for another location. I know a lot of them didn't want to see it leave, but it was such beautiful grounds here that it was a shame to leave them go the way they did. You know? I think most of them were hurt that it was moved away. I think it was empty. I guess it was offered to the city and the city was mad about it so they wouldn't buy it. They could have bought it for a dollar. And so then Orrin Ryan and Hardy Stoltenberg bought it and then they made the, made the assisted living out of it. And they hired me to come down and work on it. for. I think I worked here a month and a half probably, mostly making closets and stuff for people so they'd have a place to hang their clothes. And, I'm gonna say from 80 on, it's been empty, I'm guessing, but you know, it's been empty quite a while. That's just really deteriorated until uh, Joe took over. <laughs> it 
when that school left, a lot of, of the things in Gary seemed to go with it. And now it's back. Now it's back. And it's even going to be more interesting than before. And I hope that some of those children that went to school here can come back. And boy, I wish I could meet them. It's come to life. If you've seen it uh, in December, in the short five months that we've started this project, uh, 20, 30 guys going long hours, hard work, and all sharing the same ambition to, to uh, make this project meet our July 4th deadline for our grand opening. And one of the things that uh, the building we're in today will be a business center. We have office spaces. I believe this building was built in 1910. We're standing in the, in the entryway of what will be the the auditorium, or um, which is now called the, uh, the Sundance Ballroom. We've named it the Woodbury Hall after a, a family that was, uh, she was actually the music teacher here. Uh, Mr. Woodbury was the principal of the facility. And this will be the warming room for weddings and receptions and uh, parties, uh, family reunions. The great room, these beams are not original. There was originally four beams in here which were taken out. and. Um, we have made one more modification which we'll end up having uh, so it'll open the room up. You can see the anchor bolts in the ground. The beams will be along the walls. These beams will go away to open the, the great room up. There was originally a hardwood floor in here that will we'll be going back to a hardwood floor. We hope to be able to do a coffered ceiling in here um, in order to hide some of the plumbing. We're ahead of schedule where we thought we would be on this building. You can see the doors and the woodwork are in great shape. We intend to, to utilize all the, all the hardwood that's here. These four offices that we're standing in will be um, the company that is moving from Minnesota. As you can see, the, the hardwood floors we're standing on were covered with like a linoleum and other materials. So it's, we uncovered them and they're in great shape. We intend to refinish them and, and uh, bring them back to the, as original as we can. We removed two walls that were right here and what we intend to do with this room is it's kind of a community conference room for the two businesses that will be located in this upstairs. There's a 19-room hotel. We've tried to follow the historical guidelines of the buildings without moving doors, so you'll find the uniqueness of one nice suite to a very quaint, small, one-bedroom, uh, very small hotel room. And that's the beauty of this, uh, this place. And I think the history will come to life when you see the construction that went into this place in the 1900s. We have a 15-site campsite available this July 4th in, in a nice oak setting with a trout stream and a waterfall. I tell you, the 4th of July is going to change things. The whole the appearance around here, and it's, it's going to look different. It's, it's, we'll know more by the 4th of July or fall what, how things are going to be. So I think it's... Uh, it's going to be good for the town. I've heard several people are real anxious to see Lake Elsie back in here. Lake Elsie was built in 1934 and it was closed in 1960. That was a, a large hill at one time and that entire hill was pushed down in to fill the lake in. And we we're in the process of rebuilding Lake Elsie. We're approximately 12 feet deep now out here at the bottom. That'll be as deep as the lake goes. It will taper up into this area here, right along the edge of the trees will be the edge of the lake. This area will be the main swimming area, it will be a sand beach about four feet deep. The stream is all spring fed from about three, four miles away. It will be very clean, clear water and maybe a little chilly. There is a little contest or a little bet over who gets to take the first plunge into the, into the lake when it's done. But we're thinking we're going to throw Joe in it. <laughs> he just don't know that yet. <laughs> We finally acquired the property in late October, early November, and uh, had, had clear title by uh, December 1. So that was really the starting point of the project. And we jumped in with both feet. And uh, by January 1, we were in full swing. Me and the, Jay Grable, the contractor, talked about July 4th has always been a big weekend for Gary. So we, we made that our, our deadline. It's amazing to see where we're at uh, from what we started. 16 campsites with complete hookups. Uh, grass growing, the dam repaired, uh, the hotel completed with uh, 19 hotel rooms, uh, the ballroom here which is uh, office space above and, 
and uh, a dance hall for, and we're sitting in the courtyard where weddings and uh, business centers can hold uh, events outside. The last few weeks have been a little bit crazy, but for us to, to measure this as a success, I think, uh, one, just having no one get injured on a job site like this in a short time frame, that's, that's a success for me. Uh, to have everybody pull together and see, see the project uh, come to a completion and to meet our grand opening and to have the community buy in like they have. Uh, that's that's a success in itself. I'm very grateful for the the people that have worked seven days a week here for the last two months to get this project done and we wouldn't have made it without them. You know the community has been very supportive but the contractors that have uh, really bought into the short time frame and, and willing to work seven days a week and be away from their families to get this project done uh, I'm very grateful for those those people. I just have to say thank you to everybody that's poured their heart and soul into this along with with the family and it's just amazing what what's been done here we've had up to 60 people on the job site here we're about a week from uh, the grand opening July 4th here and uh, we made it um, since our grand opening in 2009 we've have added uh, total of 28 campsites to the campground. We've opened the Rock Room Bar and Restaurant. We also have the historic barn. There is a loft upstairs that uh, you know, accommodates, I think we had about 75 people in the barn for a wedding. A lot of unique things throughout the, the property. There's almost 75 acres here. Um, the vast majority of the, the construction that we finished up here was in phase two and phase three, and it really focused on the, the administration building. The phase two was more uh, above the rock room restaurant. We added two banquet rooms, uh, one the gold room that seats about 65 to 70 people, and then the silver room, which is uh, about 40 people. And those are primarily used for uh, private events, grooms dinners, graduations, things like that. They're real convenient for that, and it doesn't take away from the ballroom space when other events are going on over there. The administration building rooms that we've added, we call it our uh, family suite. It's uh, on the third and fourth level of the administration building, so you've got a great view of the campus as well as a balcony overlooking it. You can barbecue. It's convenient. It's quiet. You kind of have your own exclusive area. It's very family and kid friendly. It's taken the first few years to really understand what the community can support and what this property can support. And uh, we've changed some directions and now we've really got it figured out how it fits best into our community. Not all rural communities uh, can be all things and uh, we've had to eliminate some of the things we started out and we've changed some things to accommodate um, our customers. Well, now that we understand what our customer base is, we really focus on that and try to cater to just those types of groups that really fit into this property. You know, in the, in the beginning a lot of people didn't understand, or including myself, um, the challenges ahead, but we've, we've uh, I think, conquered most and we have the community support and we believe that we'll continue to be a success here. We're, it really tells the story once you see the facility. So I encourage you all to come out and see what we have to offer. And we look forward to seeing you in the near future.